Hello and welcome, dear viewer. If you are alive in the year 2021, chances are you've used audio files before. No, not that kind, the other one. Think about the different digital audio formats you know. There's WAV, MP3, maybe you also know about OGG or AAC. But I want to talk about FLAC, the free lossless audio codec. But why should you care? Well, we'll get to that later, but here are my own reasons summarized. FLAC is an open standard, there is an open source reference implementation, reasonably good documentation, and it has medium implementing difficulty. There's not much easy information on FLAC out there. Learning about FLAC gives insight into a lot of aspects of digital audio, data compression and data storage. And finally, I have spent at least two months rabbit holing myself into FLAC and implementing a decoder from scratch for Serenity OS. So first some background on the codec itself. FLAC was released in 2001, which means it's one of the newest of the first generation of compressed audio codecs, eight entire years later than MP3. It's an open standard from beginning to end and even discourages DRM measures. Although many of you may have never heard of it, it holds an important position as being very fast to decode and therefore suitable for weaker hardware such as embedded devices or even microcontrollers. Also, as you will see later, it's an ideal format for transcoding CD audio. So what's so special about FLAC? It's in the name, lossless. When we talk about file formats, generally there are three kinds. The uncompressed are the oldest and simplest, because all they do is store data. That is your BMP for images, WAV or CDA for audio and wait, there aren't really uncompressed formats for video because file sizes would be ridiculous. That's the problem with this approach in general, even though it's easy to come up with such a standard and implement it. Next, we have compressed lossless formats. These store all the data that originally existed, nothing more and nothing less, but take less space than the original data with clever tricks. You see, sensible data that we humans produce and recognize isn't really random, it has lots and lots of patterns. Compression algorithms exploit these patterns to remove information that can be fully reconstructed. For example, imagine a piece of English text. The word the would be pretty common, right? So what a text compressing format can do is instead of storing the a thousand times, it just stores, well, the word the should be at this position, that position and these other 998 positions. That will take up much less space. In fact, it's pretty much what zip does. The same thing can be done with non-text data, except other even more clever patterns are exploited. This way we get PNG for images, FLAC for audio and Google's VP9 for video. You see, here is where FLAC belongs. But just to finish up, we of course can go one step further. Lossy compression starts from the same point as lossless compression does, except this time we do another trick. Many high information types of data like audio, video and images can be stored at a level of detail that humans can't even distinguish. We can't hear quiet sounds or small differences in sound. We can't see minor differences in color or small fluctuations in light. We can distinguish even less detail in moving pictures. So lossy compression just throws away all the data that a human is unlikely to notice anyways. Here we finally get JPEG for images, MP3 for audio and H.264 for video, which is the thing you most likely call MP4. So FLAC sits in between the uncompressed codecs and the lossy codecs as being both compressed and lossless. I have been interested in FLAC for quite some time now and one time around the beginning of May, I decided to create a FLAC loader and decoder for Serenity OS's Lip Audio. If you haven't heard of the Serenity OS project yet, it's a from scratch graphical Unix operating system that is visually based on 90s user interfaces. It's a three year old open source project in an early state, so there's a bunch of work to be done, like implementing audio formats. Anyways, if you want to try out Serenity OS or even contribute, there are links everywhere. After having the struggle of my life for two months, now I understand the FLAC standard well enough to make these videos. So that hopefully other people won't struggle as much. Let's go. Before we start with anything that is specific to FLAC, it's good to have a baseline understanding of digital audio. To understand digital audio, we need to understand audio itself. 
You've probably already heard this, but fundamentally, sound is nothing more than rapidly changing air pressure, created by natural objects such as a string, a resonating body of air, or much simpler, some fancy stuff in your body that lets you speak. When I say rapid changes, I mean between about 20 and 20,000 changes per second. These vibrations happen in the pattern of waves, traveling through a medium like air. One wave is a high point and a low point in pressure that follow after one another. How often such a wave is produced is called its frequency measured in hertz. Higher frequency equals more waves per second. That's what humans can hear more specifically, that's what all of this complicated biology in your ear can decipher into high and low pitches. But let's suppose that you can't afford to have a private news speaker whenever you need them or even an orchestra at your disposal whenever you want to listen to some music. I know, hard to imagine. For that, we need to record some audio so that we can play it back later. Microphones and the likes can translate air pressure to electricity, so now we're in the electronic realm. But there are still two major problems with this signal that's now expressed in voltage. Can you guess? It's continuous in time and in gain. No matter how close you pick two points of time on the signal, there's always an infinite number of information in between them. And additionally, the signal's actual gain can take any value, at least any value loud enough and also quiet enough that your microphone could pick it up. That's just what we call an analog electric audio signal. It's simply a direct translation of another analog signal, in this case, the air pressure. But this becomes an issue once we want a computer to talk to the audio world. The information here is way too much for us to store in a computer. In fact, it's an infinite amount of information. And as you know, all computers can store as numbers, finitely many, and those numbers are also not continuous. So how do we take this analog signal and turn it into something we might call digital, something that a computer can take in, process, store, transmit, and do all of the other fun stuff that we like to do with data? The key is that humans are really bad at hearing. For starters, I already mentioned that we can't hear changes in air pressure faster than a certain point. 20 kHz is actually just an upper limit of the highest frequency. Most adults can't hear that anymore. And second, below a certain threshold, we can't discern the loudness of two different sounds at slightly different volumes. So what we can do is preserve just enough information so that a human can't figure out the difference between a real and a fake audio signal. The first step is to remove the time continuity of the signal, making it discrete in time. We do that through a process called sampling. At regular intervals, we take note of the strength of the signal, in our case the voltage, removing all the information in between. I'll not go into the details here, but because of something called the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, it is mathematically proven that we can recreate any frequency that is sampled at least twice per oscillation, meaning that if the highest necessary frequency has 20,000 oscillations per second, we need to sample it 40,000 times per second. The term hertz for describing how often something happens per second is also used for sampling, so for this we would say a sampling rate of 40 kilohertz. You might have heard of the sampling rates 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz. Those are the most common ones and the reason that they're higher than 40 kilohertz is unfortunately not something I can go into today. And second, we need to remove the remaining value continuity of these sample points. That's called quantization. We translate these voltages into whole numbers, where the lowest number represents the lowest signal strength and the highest number the highest signal strength. Now, how many numbers do we need here? The critical question is again, at what point can a human no longer hear the difference in volume? If we had six different values, we could have three different volumes for an audio wave as the signal goes both above and below zero. But it turns out that once we reach about 50,000 different volumes for signals, the human hearing stops noticing a difference. We call whatever amount of different values we allow our bit depth. Because in reality, these numbers will all be stored in binary by the computer, so it makes sense that range and values is a power of 2. By the bit depth, we don't directly mean the number of possible values, like 65,536. We instead mean the number of bits we use to store one such sample value, like 16. 
As I've already said, a bit depth of 16 is about at the limit of what humans can hear. So bit depths below that are uncommon, but above it are sometimes seen. So let's revisit that. What we have now is a list of numbers, each representing the strength of an audio signal at some point in time, with all these points in time regularly spaced according to a sample rate. The bit rate of the numbers tells us the maximum and minimum values, which represent the real-world maximum and minimum pressure or voltage. This is called pulse code modulation, PCM, and it's by far the most important way of digitizing any signal, not just audio. There are variations we can do here, but remember that this is all because circuits, real digital analog electronic hardware components, can do these conversions super easily and accurately, both going from analog to digital and from digital to analog. And unfortunately for you, the early viewer, this is where I'll end the first video on the flag series. I'm planning to cover every single part of the specification, including what you saw today, all the audio fundamentals you have to know. In episode 2, we'll have a look at how we can losslessly compress the audio data we have now obtained. And in episode 3, we'll peek inside how flag stores all of this stuff.